friends, welcome back to the Compass Church and to week four of our series called He Gets Us. In this series, we are studying the amazing teaching of Jesus Christ. Christ shows us how to live. Yes, he is God incarnate. He is the savior of the world who died on mission to save us from our sin. But while he was here, he gave the greatest instruction on how to do life that this world has ever seen. It's to be expected, is it not? When you have God who made it all, experiencing life as a human, Jesus just brings a vantage point that can't be beat. And so we've been looking at the life-altering teaching of Jesus. Remember week one was Jesus gets our insecurity. And then week two, Jesus gets our exhaustion. And then last week, uh, Jesus gets our anxiety. And now we're taking a look at Jesus gets our guilt. Friends, we've all got moral failure and we got to deal with it. So let's dive in. You know, I come to you today from the oldest pastor office of the Compass Church. You may be aware, we've got six campuses, but the very first one that started it all was our Wheaton campus. And back in 1952, our church began this building and this office was built. Today, this office belongs to Dave, my brother who is our Wheaton youth pastor. And Dave, I just, I love the office. He and I, we're brothers, but we got the same heart. I mean, the old stuff, I mean, it's filled with props. I, I love his office. And I love to think about the endless conversations that must have taken place in this room. This was the office of the very first pastors of our church, dating back again, seven decades ago. And Pastoral counseling meetings are when a congregant comes in and seeks some wisdom, some spiritual guidance from the pastor. And if we had been a fly on the wall, oh, the conversations that were had in this room. Now, I got to tell you about the most amazing pastoral counseling session that I've ever heard about. It came to me through my friend, John Woodbridge. John said, hey, Jeff, you ever had a pastoral counseling session like this? And he told the story of his dad, Charles. Charles was the pastor of the Independent Presbyterian Church of Savannah, Georgia, back in the 1950s. And he was sitting at his desk when a congregant, a young man, came in. And this guy was distraught. He had guilt. You could feel it all about him. And he brought with him an old wood box. And he put it on the pastor's desk. And he said, Pastor, I stole the contents in this box and it is eating me up. I can't live with the guilt anymore. And uh, Charles Woodbridge said, uh, young man, by the way, his name was Ira Palm. Ira, what do you got in the box? What did you steal? And he said, it's a pistol, a gun. And the pastor was a little uh, disturbed there. He's like, "Uh, tell me who you stole a pistol from. And Ira said, well, I stole it from Adolf Hitler. No kidding. And he opened the box and he took out a, this pistol, well, this is a cutout, you get it, right? But this is a picture of the actual pistol belonging to Adolf Hitler, given to him on his 50th birthday, gold ivory handle, his initials put on the side. I mean, it was precious to Hitler. And so uh, Charles Woodbridge said, Ira, where in the world did you get opportunity to steal Hitler's gun? And then the story was told. As it turns out, Ira... Palm was a soldier in the U.S. Army back in World War II, and it was on April the 30th, 1945, that he, being a part of a division called the Thunderbirds, they invaded Germany. Germany was collapsing at this point, and they actually conquered Munich, one of the cities Hitler lived in, and they charged into his home, hoping to get him there. As it turns out, Hitler wasn't home in Munich. He was up in Berlin. In fact, on that day, he committed suicide in the bunker below that city as Germany was losing the war. But when this Ira Palm was charging through Hitler's residence, he didn't find the man, but he found his office, his desk, 
And when he opened the top drawer of the desk, he saw the pistol sitting there and temptation got the better of him. He grabbed it, put it away and brought it back to the States and had been living with it for five years, but he couldn't do it anymore. And so he put it in the box, gave it to the pastor and he said, listen, he goes, I don't know what to do with it. I thought of throwing it in a lake. I just want it out of my house. He said, pastor, you're the wisest man I know. You'll know what to do with it. Pastor kept it. He's like, man, this thing is a treasure. Oddly enough, though, uh, it didn't bring him much joy. In fact, he felt icky about it. He hadn't stolen it, but it had been stolen. But mostly it belonged to one of the most evil men who has ever lived, a mo moral monster. And so having it just kind of drove him crazy. I guess that's why when, 20 or so years later, when uh, Charles Woodbridge home was invaded and the robbers took many things, including the pistol, he wasn't that sad to get, to get rid of this. Well, after it was stolen in that home invasion, it went off the grid for another 20 years or so. It was in 1987 that it resurfaced on, at auction. And it was purchased by a gun collector for $114,000, which at that point was the highest price ever paid uh, for a piece of military memorabilia. Though experts say today, if this guy chooses to sell it, he'd fetch over a million bucks for it. But amazing story, huh? You know, it, it comes back to this question of guilt. It's so interesting to me. Ira Palm was just agonized. Every time he came into his home, he felt the presence of the box. He saw the box. He knew that his uh, ugly decision was still present with him. And it got to where he just couldn't handle it anymore. He just wanted to get rid of it. And he did. Friends, it turns out we've all got a box, don't we? You may not have a gun inside of yours, but you've got sin, that which causes guilt. Your life, we all got it. Maybe inside of that box is some decisions you made in the past that were sexually immoral or the use of pornography or having an abortion or maybe it was something illegal or unethical in your business practices or maybe your anger got the better of you and you said something in, or did something you will forever regret. Maybe it's not that dramatic. Maybe it's just failure to live out the full vision you know that God has for your life. You wanted to be the best parent and a best representative of Christ, but you've never risen up to that ideal. And so you live with this perpetual guilt. Guilt is no fun. Friends, when you've got guilt, that just sense of I am terrible, it will ruin your life. It'll steal your joy, your passion for living. Good news. Jesus has a way that we can get rid of our guilt. Friends, there's a way we can give it to him and he'll take it away. So let's learn from Jesus Christ on how to deal with our guilt. Jesus was teaching outdoors in the temple courtyard when his enemies, that is the Pharisees, they arrived with, well, let me read it to you. John 8, 3, the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery and they made her stand before the group. So this woman is in trouble morally, you know, found to be compromised. And what are they up to? Well, let's see. Next verse, they said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And in the law, Moses commands us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? Oh, boy. You know, it's true. Uh, the Old Testament says as much. Let me, let me read it in Leviticus 20 verse 10 it says both the man and the woman who have committed adultery must be put to death friends this reference to the law of Moses I got this old scale here to be a visible reminder of the law the the biblical law you know the scale has been a symbol of justice of the law dating back to the Egyptians and the Romans, you know, weighing both sides and making sure that the verdict is fair. So when he appeals to the law of Moses, truthfully, 
there was a constitutional system of laws in the Old Testament governing the nation of Israel that said both the man and the woman caught in adultery must be put to death. Now, one of the questions that I had that you probably have is, where's the guy? You know, if both of them are deserving of being put to death, why did they bring the woman only if, if they were caught in the act? Well, actually, scholars believe that the guy was probably in cahoots with the Pharisees, one of, one of their friends who had orchestrated this moment. You know, they were trying to trick Jesus, to catch him, to get him uh, to say something that would diminish his popularity because right now the Pharisees were concerned Jesus was just being adored by the masses. And so they probably got one of their own to say, all right, you set up this moment with this adulterous, uh, uh, you know, moment and tell us where and when and we'll make sure there are witnesses so that we can verify that this is happening. Ay, ay, ay. This is uh, this desire to make a trap is evident in verse six, where it says they were using this question as a trap, and, and it really was a dilemma to Christ. You know, he he was called a follower of the law, and if the law says kill the adulterers, what is Jesus going to do? Jesus had this grace-based disposition where he was known to be a friend of sinners, and so they're like, oh, we got him. If he says, you know, in a grace disposition, I'll just let her go, he's violating the law. If he says, yes, let's kill her, well, then he's no longer a friend of sinners. And they were convinced they had him in a catch-22. But look what Jesus says. In verse 7, Jesus said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. That's a good one, huh? Who's going to be the first to throw a stone? You know, they would kill people by throwing stones, stoning them to death. And what's interesting is that the first one to throw the, the stone was to, be the witness, was to be the witnesses to the crime. Deuteronomy 17, verse 6 says this, Never put a person to death on the testimony of only one witness. There must always be two or three witnesses, and the witnesses must throw the first stones. So Jesus is saying, all right, Pharisees are here. Which one of you are the witnesses? There's got to be more than one, two of you at least. Which are the two that saw this happen? They witnessed the act of adultery. You step forward to throw the first stones, and I have a question for you. Are you without sin in this whole situation? And then uh, look what Jesus does in verse 8. Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground. You know, people have been wondering forever, you know, what did Jesus write? But as we'll see, whatever he wrote seemed to bring conviction to these Pharisees uh, that were there. As you think about it, the, these Pharisees who are witnesses, who would have thrown the first stone had she been stoned, they... Uh, they were guilty of a number of things themselves. Maybe what Jesus wrote in the sand was illuminating their own guilt in this whole situ situation. Friends, there was the sin of collusion, of working to bring up this whole moment. You know, remember they had been working behind the scenes to make sure that adultery was committed, that the woman was caught, that witnesses were there. This whole collusion, maybe Jesus wrote something that made them realize hey, that we were scheming to create a moment of sin. They were guilty of voyeurism, which is watching uh, sex being had by others. And these witnesses apparently saw it happening. They were guilty of injustice by bringing the woman but not the man. Maybe what Jesus wrote just helped these witnesses realize, you know, you're guilty too. You guys a big fan of justice? Let's, let's be just to both the woman but also to you, Christ is saying. Look what happens. Verse 9. At this, those who heard began to go away, one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman. They were so convicted, they're like, yeah, I, I like justice when it's applied to her, but I don't like justice when it's applied to me. And with their realization of their own 
guilt in this whole situation. They split. They lost their zeal to see justice applied. Well, look, look what Jesus says next. It says in verse 10, Jesus straightened up and he asked her, where, do, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Uh, verse 11, then neither do I condemn you, Jesus said. Go now and leave your life of sin. Christ says, no condemnation to you. You are forgiven. Christ looked into her eyes and saw her remorse, her conviction, and her repentance. And he decided to pardon her, to grant her forgiveness. Now, this makes us wonder, with Jesus making this all work out this way and the woman getting away without being killed, was Christ guilty of violating the law? That's a good question. And we're going to turn now to the book of Romans to help us understand uh, really what was going on. Romans 8 verse 1 says, there is now no condemnation. Boy, this is so parallel to what Christ said. Neither do I condemn you. He, he uh, spoke of no condemnation to the woman. There is now no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. There's a, a way to be connected to Jesus that removes our guilt. Passage goes on. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of our sinful nature. Uh, this symbolizing the law of Moses. Had we lived a perfect life without sin, we would have been saved or right with God because of the law. But because we're all sinners, the law yields us guilty. Reading on. So God did what the law could not do by sending his son to be sacrificed for our sins. Jesus paid the death penalty for our sins on the cross. The law demands death. Jesus said, I'll provide death on their behalf. Reading on. He did this so that the requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us. You see, that's the key. Jesus is able to bring grace into the game because he satisfied the law by providing the death penalty as a substitute. So friends, he introduces grace. Now when I say introduces grace, I should clarify. Grace was uh, apparent even in the Old Testament through the sacrificial system. Do you remember? The innocent lamb would be the recipient of the guilt of the people. They'd place their hand on its head and so the, the guilt would somehow be transferred to the lamb who would die on behalf of the people. It was all pointing to the cross. So it was present in the Old Testament, just not as obvious as it is fulfilled in Christ. So we've got two principles. The law, which points out we are sinners. We don't deserve being right with God. But we've got grace which says we're being given through Christ that which we don't deserve, forgiveness, reconciliation with God, heaven for eternity. So I'm going to put the cross right in front of the uh, scale because it shows that grace triumphs over the law. Or as it said in Romans 6, 14, you are not under the law, but now under grace. Christ in the cross fulfilled the law and is able to grant us a forgiveness that we'd never have if not for him. There's a, another verse here I want to read, Romans 7, 7, which says, Paul writing, am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful or bad? Paul's like, okay, so essentially we're saying, right, that grace is awesome and the law is bad. No, no, no. The law is good too. The law uh, doesn't save us, but it prepares us for the salvation found in Jesus. In fact, the woman who was caught in adultery, on that day she saw the severity of her sin with greater clarity than ever before. As those guys held stones ready to kill her, she realized, you know, th this is what I deserve. And so when grace came to her through Christ, it was appreciated all the more. So, so it is with us. Uh, let me read on. Am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? Of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. 
I would have never known that coveting was wrong if the law had not said, you must not covet. Do you see that, friends? The, the law points out that we are all moral failures and that our moral failure is a big deal. If you will, I'll go back to the box. Remember, we, remember the, the gun in the box, the, the guilty ad? Uh, we've got sin in our box. Some people would like to deny it and say, no, no, I'm pretty good. No, the law tells us there's a problem. And the, the, the law tells us it's heavy. You know, this, this commitment that you got to kill the adulterer. We'd be tempted to say everybody commits adultery. It's no big deal. But the law helps us see, no, the box is heavy. The sin is severe. And the law helps us not try to compensate. Some people, some people deny that they have sinned. Some people minimize that they have sinned. Some people compensate and say, I bet if I do enough good things, I'll take care of this problem. You can't. The law helps us realize we're in deep weeds Nothing we do can take away this problem. But what Jesus did can take away this problem. Friends, let me share a little story with you. Back when I was a college student, I, uh, I, and me, some friends and I, we, we broke into a building. We had a crowbar and we got this door open and we got into this building and we went into the elevator, rode it as high as we could. You couldn't get to the attic floor because you needed a key. But we climbed through the hatch at the top of the elevator shaft and that enabled us to get up into the attic where we took paint pens and added our signatures to many signatures that were written on the wall in the attic of this college building. Well, I was caught. Uh, the, they saw the signet. I wasn't, wasn't the brightest of criminals, you know, writing my name there. You can imagine that the public safety found me, and I got notified by the dean of students, called in to appear before him and his tribunal. Big, long table with all these suit and tie, powerful people, and me. And the guy looked at me, and he says, Mr. Griffin, did you break in and vandalize that building? And I'm like, yes. And he said, Mr. Griffin, uh, are you aware? I don't know. He goes, how much you know Illinois law and the consequence of what you did? Could I illuminate that for you? I'm like, sure. And he said, well, in, in Illinois law, breaking and entering is considered burglary, whether you steal anything or not. And he said, it's a felony. A class one felony is punishable up to five years in prison for what you did. He's like, oh, actually, no. He said, when there's damage done, which you did when you vandalized on the wall, that brings it to a class two felony, which is punishable up to seven years of prison. He goes, actually, what you did is a class three felony because it was committed against a school, which elevates it even higher. And so that's punishable up to 15 years of prison. He said, Mr. Griffin, does this help you realize the severity of what you have done? And I'm like, yeah, I didn't realize it before, but I, I do now. I'm really sorry. And then he went on to say, you know, we here at Wheaton College, we're a Christian institution. And as believers, we're big fans of grace. He says, I can see uh, remorse, repentance in you, so I'm going to show you grace. He goes, Mr. Griffin, you're free to leave. There are no consequences. Don't do it again. <laughs> and I was like, yes. Did you see? That's exactly what Jesus did in that moment with that woman. The law made her realize that she had done something horrible, but he shockingly gave her grace, making her appreciate the forgiveness he bestowed. And then when he said, go and sin no more, she was motivated to live differently, having been given a second chance by Christ. This is our story. Friends, we are those. We, we can't take care of the sin problem ourselves, but if we'll give it to Jesus, he will forgive us. He'll apply what he did on the cross and remove our guilty standing. This removal of sin, it's, it's just gone. I love how the Old Testament uses imagery to describe how gone our guilt, our sin is. Maybe you resonate with the launch imagery. Uh, there's a place where God says, this is in Psalm 103, verse 12. I will cast your sin away. I'll fling it, launch it, as far as the east is from the west, which is, you know, forever. 
Maybe you're like, oh yeah, throw my sin forever away. Or maybe you resonate with the sinking in the ocean motif where it says, God says, I will hurl your sin into the deepest sea and let it sink to the abyss. That's in Micah 7, 18. You're like, yeah, drown it in the bottom of the ocean. Or maybe you like the evaporating motif where God says, just as the rising sun evaporates the morning mist, so my grace will remove, it'll evaporate your sin. That's found in Isaiah 44, verse 22. Or maybe you like the amnesia imagery where God says, I forget it. God forgets our sin. I will think of it no more, he says, Jeremiah 31, 34. <laughs> the grace found in Jesus Christ is amazing. But let's apply the law. I'm not going to minimize it. I'm going to own it. I'm going to recognize that there's nothing I can do to take care of it. The law shows me how serious my sin is. But the cross of Christ shows me that the grace of God is greater still. That's how you get rid of guilt. You bring it to the grace one, Jesus Christ. Friends, we're going to end the service by taking communion. I've got the little communion elements that we utilize in the live services, but you may want to just get something, you know, uh, crackers, chips, bread will do, or and something to drink as a symbol of the body and blood of Christ. Jesus, on the night before he was crucified, he was in the upper room with his disciples, and he established this communion, which is a celebration that he has made a way for sins to be forgiven. Without the cross of Christ, we're doomed. But forgiveness comes through him and through him alone. On that night, here's what Jesus said as recorded in Matthew 26, 26. Here's what it says. Jesus took bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. The bread represents the body of Christ, which was crucified. He died our death so that we might enjoy forgiveness, reconciliation with God, and life eternal. Let's take it together in thanks to Christ. You know, that passage goes on saying, then Jesus took a cup. And he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Isn't that beautiful? Take the cup. And friends, what does it accomplish? The, the blood of Christ shed for us is our only hope to have our sins forgiven. This is how we can get over guilt because of what Christ did for us. Let's take together in remembrance of him. Jesus, in this moment, it dawns on me that some may be being reconciled to you, getting saved in this moment. As we turn to you and what you did on the cross for the removal of our sin, the forgiveness and cleansing of all of our guilt, Lord, this is how Life is found. And, and we're clinging to you, Jesus. Some for the first time, some of us for the thousandth time. We'll always cling to you. You are the great forgiver of our sins. And we are so grateful that we are forgiven. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.